when you have really micromanagers or just poor managers, uh, they want to have everyone do it a certain way instead of allowing people to, to do work their way. And when they do that, it stifles creativity. It stifles innovation. They want to feel seen, right? They want to feel heard. They want to feel appreciated, you know, but they want it to do it in their own way, you know, whether in a in an extroverted way or an introverted way. So I try to create an atmosphere where people can show up however however they want to show up. Today's episode of the HR LD podcast is sponsored by Deal. Now take a moment if you would to consider the following pre-show scenario. Imagine you had to visit 16 houses just to cook your dinner. One place has the pots, another has the pans, another has the stove and another has the food. You get the idea. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, the reality is most global businesses operate exactly the same way, using 16 different tools and platforms to hire, manage and pay their workforce. But now there's one platform that does it all and that's today's sponsor. That's Deal. That's D-E-E-L. And Deal is the all-in-one platform built for global work. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, from automated onboarding to performance assessments and beyond, you can manage the entire worker lifecycle all under one roof. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries or run payroll in over 100 countries. Even offer competitive benefits, equity, and equipment. With Deal's industry-leading suite of HR tools, payroll solutions, and compliance services, you can scale globally with unmatched speed and expertise. So are you ready to transform your global HR system? If you are, click in the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L. And welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. I'm your host. My name is Nick Day. I'm CEO at JGA Recruitment. We are specialist global HR recruiters. But today we're going to take a deep dive into the world of play, something I'm really excited to talk about, something brand new to the show. And we're going to see how play can really influence and have a real transformative impact on the world of HR and learning and development. Joining us today is Jeff Harry. Now, he's a renowned advocate for integrating play into the work environment to foster innovation, resilience, and happiness. And before this show, I thought I'd do a little bit of research to see, you know, why do we need to be talking about play in today's modern environment? Well, a new study by Brigham Young University said that teams that played a collaborative game together for just 55, uh, 55 minutes were actually able to increase their productivity by 20%. I'm going to remind you, increase productivity by 20%. Who doesn't want that? Well, Jeff Howe is going to help us understand exactly how we can achieve these gains. And let me just tell you, he has a really rich background in L&D. He's got a rich background in psychology and a rich background in introducing practical strategies that really help companies cultivate a more engaging and creative workplace. He was selected by Bamboo HR uh, and engagedly as one of the top 100 HR influencers. And he's been featured in New York Times, Mashable, Shondaland, Wired, Forbes, and more publications beyond. So without further ado, Jeff, welcome to the HR L&D podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling excited about this. Thanks so much for I'm having super me. super excited. Hey, we get to talk about play for 45 minutes. What could be better than that? Exactly. Before we do, let's jump into my first question. Something that I ask all of my guests. What do the words human resources mean to you? When I hear the word human resources, I think it's the only department that has the word human in the title. Oh, nice. I've never considered that before, right? Okay. Yeah. That's a nice place to start. Right? Right? Like it who who is prioritizing humanity? Who's prioritizing humans? It's HR, not marketing, not sales, not research. It's it's us. So we are the biggest advocates for our staff. Fantastic. Well, let me ask you another question. And you've defined human resources brilliantly there with the human. How do you define play? I define play as any joyful act where you forget about time, uh, where you're fully in the moment, where you're fully yourself. Uh, another way of defining play is play is the opposite of perfection. Perfection is rooted in ego and shame and constantly trying to be right, while play is rooted in like curiosity, a sense of wonder, right? A sense of awe. You know, even even the study you mentioned with Brigham Young, right, is is they're just experimenting. We're just trying this out. While when you are focused so much on perfection, that's where a, a huge amount of burnout actually comes from. 
this idea that I have to be somebody else instead of myself. Yeah, I like that. I think it, it throws so many things at me because my, you know, my background historically before I even came into the world of recruitment right, was theatre. And when you work in theatre and you've studied theatre, mm. you're always playing, you're always improvising, you've got to be prepared to put yep. yourself out of your comfort zone. Then I think of my family business, which is outside of the world of recruitment, and that's based on baby development studies, right? My mum is a founder of a baby group uh, uh, called Our World Group or mm. Baby Sensory. And again, you look at babies and children, and they're all about play. It's so it just comes so naturally, that kind of sense of wonder, that sense of fun. And we're not, we haven't got all these sort of social constructs that make us feel like we have to be perfect all the time. So with that in mind, how does play relate then to the, the constant quest for perfection in the workplace? Because they, they must be kind of bashing into each other. Yeah, there's this great quote by Stephen Johnson who says, you'll find the future where people are having the most fun. And when you think about that, you're like, you're, oh, you'll find the future where people are having most fun. What does that actually mean? That means that those are the places that are most innovative, right? Those are the places that are taking the most risks. They're the most creative. Like during the pandemic, there were organizations like TikTok where it was the place to be. A lot of people wanted to be there because that's where a lot of creation was happening. And if you think about it for your industry, Ask yourself, is your organization one of the most fun organizations in your industry? Then you won't have an issue with recruitment. You won't have an issue with retention because people want to be there. But if you are still stuck on the antiquated approaches, then you might become like the next blockbuster video or the next Sears, you know, like just just maybe you're around, but just not that relevant because you're not taking the risks or not um, tackling the most interesting issues in the industry. So how do we get that balance right then? If we're thinking about, and I associate the word fun with the word play, right? It, bring, it brings, just saying the word play brings a smile to my yeah. face. But we've also, we've also got to get a balance, certainly from an HR perspective, between productivity, which mm -hmm. ironically in my quote I gave earlier, 20% uplift in productivity when you play, yeah. but also that kind of a level of seriousness with that level of fun. Like how do you manage that yeah. expectation, that balance? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think I think it starts from a first from a place of psychological safety, right? And what do we mean by psychological safety? A place where people feel seen, heard, appreciated and valued. You know, I I was uh hanging out with a friend yesterday. He just became CMO of a new job. It's a uh, remote and um everyone's remote, but they can they they're trusted to get their work done the way they need to get their work done. So there's like, there's, there's room on the playground to show up your way, as long as you get your work done, as long as you do it in the right way. Um, and I think a lot of times when you have really, uh, how I would describe it, micromanagers or just poor managers, uh, they want to have everyone do it a certain way instead of allowing people to, to do work their way. And when they do that, it, it stifles creativity. It stifles innovation. Um, so in order to, I believe you have to find that balance. It's like, if you're getting your work done and you're doing it your way, great. Then we're going to let it. If you're not, then we're like, we're going to have to create a system or have to create um, structure so that you have to get it done, you know, through our process. But we we have to we have to trust our staff that they're going to get their work done. And if they're not, then maybe they're not the right fit for the organization rather than be like, everyone's got to do it this way because then you're destroying people's ability to be who they are through your organization. Yeah, that makes and that's where a lot of the play comes from allowing yourself to be who you are. So how do we link that then to the people listening to the show? We're, we're, most of our listeners are going to be HR professionals, HR directors, HR managers, or L&D professionals, learning and development professionals. How do we bring play into the work environment without it being, I guess, one of these things that everyone kind of isn't quite sure about coming, getting involved in? You want to make it natural, right? You want people to want to play more without it yeah. being just this awkward, you know, if, if I bring people in and say, you've got to, I want everyone to role play. Everyone kind of hides inside their shell. It doesn't really work. So how do yeah. we start to incorporate play through our learning and development strategies? And why is it really important that we can do that? Yeah. So, so I hate forced fun. I despise it. It's <laughs> not my jam. I, I ran team building events for like 10 years. So like icebreakers and, you know, and like trust falls, like 
that's that's not the type of play I'm talking about. You know, I'm not even talking about like having slides or ping pong tables in your place. Right. Um, I'm talking about allowing staff to pursue their zone of genius. You know, Google a long time ago, I don't know why they stopped doing this. Google used to give their staff 20% of their time to pursue whatever they wanted, as long as it benefited Google. It was like five hours a week, maybe sometimes 10 hours a week. Um, and from allowing them to pursue their interest, what came from that was Google AdSense, Gmail, Google News, Google Earth, like the foundations of Google came from play. So it's not about telling people, all right, now we're going to play everybody and we're going to play this way. It's more the idea of like creating this opportunity, creating this playground where it's just like, okay, we're trying to solve a certain problem. How do we do it in a way that provides freedom for people to do it their way, allow them to tap into their zone of genius? And when I say zone of genius, I'm referring to the the work where they forget about yeah. time, the work they do, even if they they um, weren't getting paid to do this work. They just love to do this type of work, figuring out your staff's zone of genius and allowing them to use that zone of genius to solve your problems. And when you're allowing that level of play and creating that level of psychological safety where people can fail internally, not externally, but internally. That is what I mean by play. That's what I mean by like creating a place where people can be innovative and creative. I'm familiar. That's uh, the zone of genius comes from Gay Hendricks's book, doesn't it? I think I, I remember he talked about that a lot. Exactly. Exactly. Google Gay Hendricks and you'll find out more about the zone of genius. So what I'm hearing then really is it's not about, as you say, bringing in exercises or doing trust falls, as we're all familiar with, us, familiar with those things. This is more about a cultural shift. It's about creating a culture of play within an organization. Now we're speaking yeah. sort of an HR language. So how do we, how do we go about achieving that? If, if we haven't got that at the moment, what are the next sort of practical steps, the five practical steps, whatever it might be, that you would recommend to help organizations and HR leaders start to take the right path towards a more playful and creative environment? I think it starts with the people listening on this podcast, right? It starts with you simply first figuring out how do I pursue my zone of genius, right? How do I play more in the workplace for myself, right? And then once you figure that out, then start doing that with your staff and be like, okay, let's, let's make these meetings more exciting. How can we make these meetings more engaging, more playful? Hey, let's not have them inside the office, right? No, let's, let's have some ice cream before we have a meeting. Let, let's just do something different to break the mold of anything that feels stale, right? So look for each and every one of your stale processes and just be like, how can we make them more interesting? Right. And, and and brainstorm with your staff on how to do that, because every place is different. You know, I'm spe I speak all over the country here in the U.S. and sometimes in Canada and other parts of Europe. And each place is uniquely different. So because of that, there isn't so much. And this is what frustrates a lot of people is like there isn't so much of a formula of like this is how you play, because even that controls play. Yeah. Right. It controls how one shows up rather than me being like. What is your type of play? You know, I do this exercise where we actually have uh, and I'm actually doing this with a few creative organizations that you'd be amazed that they're not playing enough. Right. But I'm having them reflect back on like, what did they love to do as a kid? Right. What did you love to do as a kid? Right here. We'll give in a great example. What, give me one example of something you love to do as a kid. Oh, acting today. was one. I mean, I love love playing around role play. Role play was great. Um, football. I mean, I was, I, was acting. Okay. I was an active kid. So let's let's just go let's go with acting, sure. right? Let's go with acting. So what were the three core values that you three play values that you loved about acting? Uh the ability What was it about? The ability acting? just to to lose myself in someone else's identity and be the thing that you want to be, whether you want to be an astronaut as a kid or a footballer or whatever, that was just exciting. Um the ability to to, uh -huh. to play out fantasies with with you know with other friends. So you again you can create worlds, not just people, and it was collaborative. So you and it was Sweet. your mates and your, and your pals. Um, and sometimes the ability to say things that you can't always say when you're a chick, when you're a kid, because you can kind of put it down as acting. You can do things in front of your parents. You can go a little bit risque or whatever. And it's, it's quite exciting. Well, risque, reaction. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the audience reaction as well is a big part of it, right? If, that, if you want to be an acting, we like giving joy to others and seeing their reaction and, and their applause. So that was always a, an appealing part. 
Okay, so I, what I hear heard as some of the play values is bringing joy to others, right? Creating new worlds, being a list, little risque, yeah. right? Just taking some risks. And then also you mentioned like being out of other people's shoes, right? Right. So you could take you could take a bunch of those values and anyone could do this, right? Identify those values and to be like, okay, we have those four core values. How do we incorporate more of that into our work? Right. That's our flow work. That's our zone of genius work. Anyone can do this at any time. Anyone can do this with their staff where they're like, okay, what did you love to do? How do we how do we get you more into that zone of genius, more into that flow work? These are like small ways in which one can do it rather than the grandiose, like we're all going to go to an escape room. Because the fact of the matter, if two people hate each other before we go in the escape room, they're not we're not going to leave and be like, all right, Samantha and Jake now are, are just really good, good friends now. No, you lock them in a room together. They're, they're, they're not they still don't like each other. So. That's the type of play that I'm talking about is this this play of giving people freedom to discover that zone of genius, to discover their flow work. So let me let me ask. I mean, I'm intrigued because you mentioned earlier that you started with team or you've been involved in team building, that you're now doing talks all over North America, Canada, sometimes Europe. What was your background, Jeff? What was the um, the zone of genius moment, the aha moment that suddenly made you go, you know what? This is this is my zone of genius. This is what I want to do. Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, so my story started with uh, Big. Remember the? Do you ever see the movie Big yeah, with Tom love, Hanks? I don't know movie, if you did. Movie. Uh, okay, I love the so film. For anyone that's seen Big, if you haven't, it's great. Tom Hanks, it's amazing. So I saw that in like third grade, right? And I started writing toy companies as soon as I saw it. Well, first I went to the toy store. I went to F.E.O. Schwartz to get discovered, just like what happened to Tom in, in the movie, but I didn't get discovered after dancing on a piano. So then I started literally writing toy companies in third grade. Um, and I just didn't stop. I didn't stop until I got into the toy industry 15 years later, I think 10, 15 years later. And then um, I don't know if you've ever gotten exactly what you've always wanted and then been so disappointed when you got there, but there was like, there was no toys, no joy, no high fives, nothing. So I left New York, came to the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, bumped into an organization on Craigslist, which is a super shady site uh, here in uh, the Bay Area. And uh, they taught kids engineering with Lego. And I had I had messed around with Lego at and uh, in college as part of a program. Um, and there were only seven people, but they were teaching kids engineering with Lego. And I was like, I want to play for a living. And we took the company from seven people to 400 people. It became the largest Lego inspired STEM organization in the U.S. Um, and we started touring with with Lego. We started partnering with like Facebook, Google, all of them. Um, I started running team building events with all these places. And then while we were running team building events with all of the top companies in the U.S., I realized there was something missing because as much as like team building was like helpful, it wasn't making the teams better. They weren't having harder conversations. They weren't addressing bigger issues. So I went back, started studying positive psychology and um, started creating a talks. And one of my first talks was dealing with toxic people in the workplace through play. Right. And I just started creating talks that I thought would be actually helpful you know, inside um, organizations. Like, how do you have a hard conversation? How do you deal with toxic masculinity? How do you create psychological safety through play? Um, and doing it in a fun way so that we could address really hard issues because I didn't feel we were addressing them through our team building stuff. Um, yeah, and that was like five years ago when that had four or five years ago. And then when, uh, the you know, the, the pandemic abated a bit, um, then I started just touring around and then now I'm probably speaking 60, 70, uh, events a year. Amazing. Talking. Funnily enough, we actually had, um, I don't know if it was, if they're related or where they got their background from, uh, from your old organization, but, um, we had a team building event in our business at JJ recruitment recently, which was all Lego building and it was great fun. I mean, it was, a team oh yeah. Event. Yeah. Like serious great play. Fun. Great. We went down the store. Yep. Yeah. Really, really good. Um, so I'm interested as well because, you know, I, I didn't mention it in the introduction, but you've worked with some some of the world's biggest organizations, right? You've worked with Google, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, Adobe. You've worked with the NFL, Amazon, Facebook. These are big, big corporations with big personalities as well. And I think of, you know, and how they differ. Yeah. 
does does that change the way that you approach play based on the sector, the vertical, the size, or actually is this completely transferable, independent of size, scope, and brand? I think I think it's completely transferable because at the end of the day, humans are humans, right? And you're not working with all of Facebook. You're working with a small team at yeah. Facebook, right? You're not working with all of Southwest Airlines. You're working with like just, you know, specifically aspects of their HR department, you know, with every organization that I've ever worked with, whether they're government, nonprofit or for profit. It's fascinating because you'll see the kid in people. Like people want to connect, right? People constantly want to connect. They want to feel seen, right? They want to feel heard. They want to feel appreciated, you know, but they want it to do it in their own way, you know, whether in a, in an extroverted way or an introverted way. So I try to create an atmosphere where people can show up however, however they want to show up, right? Just like a playground where you're like, you don't have to be all in. Um, and that's the thing that's really powerful about play is like, it's voluntary, you create this atmosphere where you're like, hey, we're playing. And if you'd like to, you can. But it's but it's an invitation to play rather than being like you have to, because once you tell people you have to play, it's not fun anymore. It's not play. Then that's just like another thing that you have to do. And then that just sucks. And I've seen that with organizations that are like, all right, we're going to sing the song of the company to start every day. Like there are a few toxic organizations that do that and it's just painful to watch people because they're just like i hate this job like as they're singing the song they're like i'm gonna look for another job like they you can yeah. see it in their mind right because and and it's because it's not joy anymore you're you're forcing fun and that's just actually no a friend of mine works in an organization where he has to do that and it does exactly how he feels you, you summed it up perfectly i certainly know when you're talking about toys when we think about toys when we go back the nostalgic feeling always brings good conversation, real positive conversation. We're thinking of nostalgic programs or nostalgic toys we used to play with, uh, for sure. So but bringing it back to, um, to the HR conversation then, what was the, what's the kind of the first thing you would ask an HR practitioner when you're going into an organization, regardless of who that organization is, that you'd want to know and understand before you can sort of implement suggestions or change? Yeah. I think I would start off with, What it, when you think of your organization, does trust come up? Is that one of the first values that you think of when you when you think of? And I'm not talking about the mission or the core values. I'm talking about like, g give me a vibe of your organization. What's going on right now? You know, and does the word trust show up? Right. And then from there, I'd be like, OK, how you know, how have you built psychological safety in this organization? Like, what are we doing? Right. Um, how do you make sure your staff feel seen, heard, appreciated, valued? Um, another question I ask people is just like, do you do you know your staff's languages of appreciation? Like, is that even a thing y'all do where you figure out how they like to receive, you know, or do you know their zone of genius or have you even explored what that is? Do you even know what a, what zone of genius is? Right. You know, I ask various questions like this, all just based off of like. What what are the priorities? I even ask the question of like, what do your organization's actions say about your values? I don't want to know about your values. I want to know about your organization's actions. Do they come? Do they prioritize your people? Do they prioritize profit? Um, do they prioritize profit over people? Can you have you figured out how to do both at the same time? Which is great and very doable. Um, those are the types of questions that I want to ask because I'm really trying to get an understanding of where on the priority level are is staff and the and taking care of staff because this might you know be a um what is it a, an opinion that not everyone uh cares for but I think if you treat your staff well everything else takes care of itself and it's amazing how many organizations say they believe that but their actions don't communicate. Hello, HR and people leaders. Are you exhausted of the war for talent cliche? The problem is when we hear a cliche, it usually exists for a reason. However, we think it's time for a fresh approach to the talent crisis. 
That's because at JGA Recruitment, we understand the real challenges you face in sourcing phenomenal HR and people candidates. And guess what? We think we have the solution. Our team is on a mission to revolutionize your hiring process. That's because we're not just recruiters, we're strategic partners dedicated to finding HR and people professionals who align perfectly with your company's vision and goals. So let's break the cycle of frustration together. Partner your talent acquisition strategies with JGA Recruitment and experience the difference in service, excellence and results. No longer do you need to suffer the costs associated with a poor hire because with over 100 five-star Google reviews and already trusted by many of the world's leading brands, why don't you take action today? Contact us at jgarecruitment.com to discover how we can help transform your HR and people teams. And here's a bonus. When you visit us, you can sign up for our weekly HR newsletter that's packed with invaluable industry insights and more. Let's revolutionize your HR talent acquisition strategies together and make the war for talent a cry from the past. Visit jjrecruitment.com to find out more. Well, it links very closely to a previous guest we had on the show, Stephen Covey. And he talked about if you trust and yeah. inspire, you need to be able to have that trust that you mentioned before, before you can inspire your workforce. I thought that was really interesting. I think something I took away from what you just mentioned there as well, that something that, um, I can't, I, apologies, I can't reference who it was that mentioned it to me as an idea, but... Sometimes the things we hate doing at work is the thing that someone else at work will love to do. And I brought this into my workplace exactly. and there's some sort of creating presentations. I like delivering for, for sure. I like creating the content, but actually putting it all in, together into a creative piece on you know, Canva or whatever is like, I, I, for me, I just lose hours of time. And um, I spoke to a colleague right. of mine and, and um, our customer success manager. And she said, you know what, Nick, I love doing that work. I'm like, hey, this is just, I play all day. I put things in it. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I know that's slightly different, but the, she used the word play when she came back. She said, I'll play all day, mucking around and changing logos and making it look pretty. For me, it's, I don't want to do it. She wants to do it. It's a really good delegation swap. Yeah. For me, that's sort of a small example of where I think it can be quite productive. I don't know if you would consider that as play, but I'm thinking of it because she said the word play to me. Oh, absolutely. I. I actually do an exercise, and it's an exercise probably all L&D people know, right, where I break teams up into four quadrants based off of their personality, right? You know, are you an innovator, someone that comes up with a lot of really creative ideas, and that's just your jam? Are you a, a coordinator? Are you a detail-oriented person that loves to take chaos and make order out of it? Are you a boss that's like very decisive and making a lot of decisions all the time and it's like a GSD or, or are you a nurturer, someone that prioritizes people first and is all about getting buy-in? So I have them go into these different quadrants or these different sectors of the room just to show the organization, look at the different personalities that are here and also what is missing. Because you really want to make sure that you have, you need every aspect of purpose. And there's, there's so many other, there's so many different personality programs or like the, I think there's like the color ropes and yeah. th that identify different types of people, right? Everyone has one of these. Um, but it's this whole idea of like, how do we make sure that we have a balanced organization where we have different types of skill set? And this is where then it ties in where I talk a lot about healthy masculine and healthy feminine uh, leadership traits, because when you have both of those, you have a very healthy organization. But when you skew so toxic one way or the other, where like, let's say you have a very toxic masculine leadership team that's very decisive and very cognitive, they don't celebrate emotional intelligence. They don't celebrate intuition. And because of that, people don't feel seen and heard and appreciated there, right? Play is a very feminine leadership trait. You know, it's built off of collaboration. It's built off of intuition. It's built off of EQ um, and many other aspects. Um, and when you don't have that in your organization, that's you're lacking a ton of, of creativity. You're lacking a ton of opportunity to um, 
think outside the box, as they say, right? Right. Um, to be actually innovative, like to really challenge or push the envelope. So I challenge organizations after we do the quadrants and then we go through the healthy masculine, healthy feminine. I'm like, what's missing from your team? What traits are missing? And how do we cultivate those traits? Because frankly, there's someone in your organization right now that probably loves to do the thing you hate. And if we can find that, Everyone gets right, better work right. done. Couldn't agree more. You put that really well. You mentioned a few times the, uh, well, you mentioned trust early, you mentioned psychological safety a couple of times. For me, psychological safety, and again, not everyone will agree with this opinion, but I think it's the cornerstone of what makes, you know, of all HR strategy. Right? If you haven't got that bit down, everything yeah, else exactly. is, on, is written on a bad foundation. But you've mentioned it a few times on today's exactly. show. So why is that such a critical metric in terms of, of play and how, how can we then utilize both psychological safety and play to really transform organizational dynamics? I think it's so important, in addition to the fact that I keep saying feel seen, heard, appreciated, valued, right? I think psychological safety, it, it doesn't force me to code switch. And for people that aren't, aren't familiar with code switching, it's this whole idea of like, do I have to act when I when I show up to work, right? And let's talk about it from like a, a play standpoint, right? Like from like a theater standpoint, right? When you're, when you're a theater actor and you're playing a role that you resonate with, you, it's, it's easy. It's freeing. It's just you being you. You're just having a good time. But when you have to play a role you hate, it's exhausting. You don't want to share, you're at a meeting and you're like, I don't, I don't feel like saying anything. I mean, a lot of times people measure psychological safety by your ability to speak your mind to anyone in the organization. Like right there, you can just measure it there. Another way in which I describe this, and I think this is from John Amici, a, a former uh, NBA basketball player. He would say work culture is defined by the worst behavior tolerated. So what's the worst behavior tolerated in your organization? That's your culture, Right. Not what's on the posters on the wall with the eagle saying leadership. I actually think if you have more of those, you know, inspirational posters on your wall, that's probably a more toxic workplace. Just that's the sign. Right. Um, but so and I remember this guy, Lee Meadows, once said to me, he goes, uh, be careful that your culture, be careful that your bad habits have not created your culture. And that is what we have to be looking at, right? What is the worst behavior we're tolerating? What is our bad habits? How is that affecting us? Because if, we're, if we have someone toxic running amok, being mean to a lot of people, and then that person is promoted, am I going to play at work? No. Am I going to share anything at work? Am I going to be innovative? I mean, how's Twitter coming along right now, right? How many people think innovation is happening at Twitter at this point, right? I still call it Twitter. I refuse to call it the new name or whatever name it was, right? Because so it's just like you see that, right? You see there's no fun happening there. So there's no future that's happening there. So when I'm, I'm talking to organizations, I'm like, it's not even just that you, ha that you play because it would be beneficial. If you don't play you will become obsolete. Like, I don't know if you've met Gen Z, but they don't give up, you know, about they'll walk out immediately. They they drove the great resignation, right? Millennials and Gen Xers left after Gen Z left, right? They're driving a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, protest right now. So if you're coming with this my way or a highway approach, or if you're coming with this, like, you know, you got to, um, there's, you know, play is separate from work, um, or you can't be yourself at work. I mean, I'm, like, again, not like you're, you're that corny, be your authentic self, but like less, less faking it and more me. Um, if you're not doing that, you're going to get left behind. You're just going to get left behind. And that's what I ask major organizations all the time. Are you okay with that? Yeah. No, it's, it, I'm just pondering and thinking back. I guess the, the question I'd have then for you is what's taking everything you've just said on board, what's the hard question an HR person listening to this, an HR practitioner listening to this now can, can take away to potentially be confronting, but to really help embrace play in their professional lives, play in their organizations. What's the hard questions they need to be asking of their C-suite or of their colleagues to, to, 
to put them on the right track. Okay, this this is not is this will not sound playful, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because we have to ask hard questions. You just said yeah, hard okay. questions, so let's okay. do it. All right. The first question, because again, you have to create the psychological safety. You have to create the fun right. playground in order for people to play. So we have to clear the glass from the playground, right? We have to clear the toxicity from the playground. So which managers should not be managers? That's probably one of the first questions. Why do you have certain managers in positions of power that are horrible leaders, right? Let's let's address that. Um, and uh, there was a study recently done, Fortune featured it, where they found 82% of bosses, right, managers, were promoted to their next job with no training whatsoever. Yeah. None. And when they asked these managers what they hated most, they said training, right? And you you know this is an L and D professional because you have to work with some of these toxic people that are like, I don't even want to do this. And you're like, why do we have to do this? Because you're you're horrible at your job, right? So that would be one of the first ones. A second qu hard question to ask is, you know, what do you, your organization's actions say about their their values? Right. There is an organization recently who reached ten billion dollars in sales. I won't say which organization, but they reached ten billion dollars in sales. How do they reward their staff? Did they give them bonuses? Did they give them raises? No, they made these cookies that said ten B on them and sent them out to staff. And they sent them out late, so they were stale by the time they arrived to staff. Right. That communicates that their values, right? So what does your organization's values say about how much they care about their staff? Um, so just those two questions, first and foremost, after you've addressed those hard questions, then you can get into, okay, how are we cultivating our staff's zone of genius? How are we, how do we make sure our staff actually feel seen, heard and appreciated? Can, let's have that conversation with them, right? How do we, create an environment um, where we're focused on motivating them through their language of appreciation. Because if, if someone's like, I, I get motivated by money and you're like, well, I like to give quality time. That's horrible. Like, you know, I, I want money. Okay, great. That's your motivation. We're going to use that as the motivation, right? Like actually taking the time to figure out why they're there. I even do this in a lot of my workshops where I'm like, what are you doing here? Why are you still here? Like having that, what's, what's the most meaningful and memorable moment from last year that roots you to your work, that reminds you why you do this work? Do you know that for yourself? Do you know that for your staff? Go find out. Go find out. If you do any of those things, that starts to build the safety net so that people feel comfortable to play and play at their own time, not when you're ready to play, but when they're ready. To and then play. If it, for those that are, are listening to audio only, I, I had a bit of a giggle. You wouldn't have seen it. I'm smiling here because you've got my nerve on spying. Uh, you gave a hard hitting question, but they're so obvious. And actually, you know, if I think with my recruitment hat on now yeah. as a recruitment CEO, the biggest reason that people leave companies is bad leadership. It's not money. It's not financial wealth. It's bad leadership is number one. But that's how you mentioned that. But then you talked about values. And actually, one of the biggest things now for the Gen Zs, if you want to approach them in, if you're struggling for talent, you've got to get your values right. The first thing they do is they go to a website and they check yeah. and they want to make sure a company's living those values, not just putting a, a yeah. rainbow logo on when the time is right and then doing nothing else to to, to follow yeah. a mission. They want to make sure that the companies are living and breathing the values that they promote. So I think you've hit on two really pertinent areas certainly in my world of recruitment and i think companies now struggling to find staff and struggling with retention there's two great questions and they are hard-hitting questions but they're obvious ones i was laughing because we don't ask those questions of ourselves enough and and you actually give a really great point from a recruitment standpoint right i was doing a talk recently for hr houston and um we talked about the milwaukee public library this is so ridiculous. Why do I know anything about the Milwaukee Public Library? I don't even like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't talk about libraries a lot. But if one go, go to Milwaukee Public Library's TikTok or their Instagram page, it's just these librarians just posting about what it's like to be a librarian. But they're having fun doing it. And they're being themselves and the, and Milwaukee Public Library allowed them to make these videos that are really interesting for them. It gives a glimpse 
as to the culture of that organization without them even having to go to the website to find their values. You just watch one of your videos and you know what their values are. You know how fun that is. How come that's helped them not only increase recruitment, increase retention, but random people are now just showing up to the Milwaukee Public Library that have no connection to it. I have friends in other countries that are like, oh, yeah, have you ever heard of this library? Like, so they're like creative ways, again, play, right? Creative ways you can use play for recruitment, for and and again, you're allowing people to play their way and discover and that ultimately benefits your organization. So yeah, check well, that I'll out. Yeah, definitely be checking that. Actually reminds you of something else. And, and uh, it's an individual that does um, sometimes, uh, people have binary views, but Jeremy Clarkson and The Farm, I don't know if you're familiar with that on Netflix, but he's uh, he's he's the ex-host of Top Gear. And um, he bought a farm, oh, okay. but he's so playful on The Farm that it's just an absolute blockbuster. And all, he ever, all he's ever doing on that farm is having fun buying big pieces of machinery at a hovercraft on the last one. And it's brilliant. Like he's got a farm shop that you can't get anywhere near. It's just cars all the way down the high street. People are desperate to come and see this farm in action. He's made it playful. But more importantly, despite the branding benefits he's getting, you can see that they're just having a good time. And that means you want to come yes. to work. And that is such a difference. So let me ask, we'll finish with one question and because – for me, when I initially came into this conversation, I associated play with fun, which we've talked about, but also play with comedy. Yeah. Of course, play and comedy aren't always the same thing. And sometimes you can go too far yeah. one way. I'll give a, an example, which I'm probably be disapproved of here. We don't do it anymore, but we used to. We used to have a little name to keep things fun at work. We'd have a word that you had to get into a conversation. So it might be tomato. You know, all very into word. You know, oh, a yeah. telephone call. You know, what, yeah. all of my staff, they've got to be on the phone speaking to clients and candidates. And they had to get the random word of the day into the call. And we just, it made it fun to do the calls. But we were just wondering whether that was going against the professional nature of what we do. And it's getting that balance right. And sometimes you'd get a giggle and think, okay, where well, have we gone a little bit too far? So that's a genuine example of something we used to do in our, in our office. So where's the boundary between play and comedy and play and fun? Where are the distinctions between them? Can they all marry together? Do they need to be, I don't know, just, just intrigued to know your perspective and how you see those terms. Yeah. So, you know, I'll answer it this way. So I love comedy, right? I used to do stand up way back in the day, you know, I messed around with it. And, you know, when you get someone to laugh, it's a painkiller. It's, you know, it conjures up endorphins, which literally takes pain away. So when you get people to laugh at a meeting, you're taking pain away from the meeting. Another way to take away pain from the meeting is just cancel the meeting. I don't know why we're having so many meetings. So we should also yeah. look into that, you know, like, come on, or just 20 minute meetings or 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be 60. OK, so there's that. Um, but I think with comedy and work, the reason it gets so messy is because people have different versions of what they think is right. funny. And if you're going to bring comedy in the workplace, it shouldn't be harmful, right? It shouldn't be at the expense of somebody else, right? That's where, that's where you can offend people, right? That's where it's not, you know, unless it's a, <clears throat> it's a clear roast, <clears throat> Yeah, unless it's a clear roast where it's just like, hey, guess what? You know, I just went to a friend's um, party the other day and they roasted him because it was called his birthday roast. And the whole time I was like, oh, I don't know if you should say that. So you could even see where there's like that fine line. But especially in the workplace, it's just like, OK, let's make fun. But why do we have to make fun of someone else? So I sure. look better. Right. That's where it's just like the hierarchy is created. And the thing that's powerful about play is play reduces hierarchy. It actually minimizes it so that when I'm sharing what I love to do as a kid and I'm sharing my inner child stuff, right? I'm sharing what I, you know, my values and I'm sharing it with another C suite executive and I'm not to that level. All of a sudden, we see each other's inner child. We see each other and we're like, oh, man, you, you used to play with Lego, too. I didn't know you played with Lego. Oh, that's so interesting. And then the hierarchy disappears and people feel more connected. So you want comedy that is actually going to help bring people together, not separate them. And if you are not skilled in comedy, then don't right. try it. Let you Stick with your strong suits. Like, don't do your stand up routine. You know, there is... um. I, I studied laughter yoga for a little bit, and it was interesting that um, the guy that created laughter yoga, 
was a physician that found that when his patients laughed more, it actually got them out of the hospital quicker. They healed faster. Um, so he started telling jokes in the park as a way of like, you know, creating laughter yoga, but he was a horrible uh, comedian. So he ran out of jokes after two days. Um, so then he just started pretending to laugh. And that actually was effective enough. <clears throat> he didn't have to, um, you know, force comedy. And now he was able to create laughter yoga and people start with like fake laughing and then they actually still heal that way. So again, you know, calm down on the comedy if you don't know how to do it. Um, and also do comedy that brings people together rather than separates Super. people. No, it oh, breaks people apart. Perfectly. Well, look, we're going to open the L&D vault in just a moment. I uh, just want to ask you if there's anything I haven't asked that you wanted to bring awareness to or attention to for our listeners. And if not, we can jump into the vault. Yeah, I just did a talk recently on the four-day oh, work yeah. week. Um, and talk about play, right? Like talk about um, – I was speaking to an organization and they have to think of like all these new creative marketing ideas that basically save the organization. And they were like, if I had three days off where I could do my chores and then I could hang out with my family and then I could go on a hike or something like that, you know, or just pursue things that I liked, I think I would have more epiphanies that would actually help my organization out. And there's so many more studies that are communicating you are more productive in four days and five days, right? And a lot of those are coming out of the UK, right? I think they recently did a study where 56 out of 61 companies that did a four-day work week still keep it, right? Reduced uh, stress, uh, higher profitability, higher productivity, uh, lower costs, um, and so much easier to recruit. So just exploring, that's just one example of like playing with new um, systems um, as a way to address issues. I think that's worth exploring. And when you're trying things out like this, you set the tone for your industry. And then all of a sudden, your company is the one place that everyone wants to be at. Right. So think about that. Your future is where the people are having the most fun. Steven Johnson, I'm telling you, that is real. Amazon back in 98 was the place to be because they were solving some of the most interesting issues. Now that he's become Lex Luthor, no, not as many people want to go over there. Right. So we have to be thinking about how are we creating fun because that is where you will create the future for your organization and that will dramatically help your recruitment as well as your yeah, 100%. retention. Actually, I know some of the companies that have been trialing that in the UK and certainly it's big news and we're seeing more and more of it the four day week. So watch this space uh, for sure. So let's open the HR and vault. Uh, three short, sharp questions here for you, Jeff. First is if you could give one piece of universal yep. advice, what would it be? Ooh. Oh, you either claim who you are or you end up chasing your worth for the rest of your life. So you got to decide, what are you going to do? Choose to be me or choose to be yourself or chase your worth. Beautiful. No, That's no your choice. Reflecting on your career start, what advice do you give to others just starting out in this new world of work? No one knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're all making it up as we go along. So the more you're willing to fail faster, succeed sooner, the more you're willing to try stuff out and be like, I don't like that. I'm out, you know, or I enjoy that. I'm going to focus more on this. Just figure out who you are in the workplace. Figure out what you enjoy. Figure out what your flow work. Um, because the, the quicker you figure out who you are, the quicker you'll find the organization that you want to be a part of. If you do the opposite, where you're chasing your worth and trying to do what you think is the right thing based off of what your parents said or your friends or whatever society, um, you'll find yourself, you know, in your 30s or 40s being like, why am I in this industry? I should have never chosen this in the first place. You know what, that, that reminds me, um, you really eloquently put. Of, uh, I think it was Michael Neal in, in, who said that um, he's a, a very famous coach, US coach, actually, but I think he used to live in Wales. Um, but he was talking about mm. a, a, a fictional scenario where someone comes to him and says, look, uh, I want to take over my father's business. I want to 
wanting to te- teach me how I can be a better marketeer, how I can grow the business, how I can do all these different things. I want to be this, this great thing. And he said, oh, okay. They, they get, had the coaching session. And after the session, he reflected back and thought, I'm going to have a look at this, this guy's notes. So he had a look at his pre-notes. And he realized that the guy he was coaching was called Jesus. And he was from a little town called, uh, called Nazareth. And he comes and asks himself, do I really want to be teaching this guy to be a great carpenter? Or is there something else he's probably meant to do? And I was just, it just reminded me of what you just said, right? Sometimes we can think we're on the path because everyone else wants us to be on that path. And we get on the treadmill, we yep. can ask ourselves yep. enough questions or ego gets in the way. Um, but actually, if we let that go and really look inward, um, sometimes we can find out what our real calling was. I thought it was, um, it was Michael Neal's story, but I thought he put it much better than I just did, by the way. <laughs> but uh, hopefully you got the vibe. I, I love that. And it also reminds me, like, you know, especially for Gen Z and especially for Gen Alpha, 30% of the organizations that you're going to be working for don't exist. It's true. You know, Facebook, Google, you know, TikTok didn't exist like, I don't know, 20 years ago. So people forget how quickly an industry, industries change. So, that's why like your ability to be adaptable is probably one of the mo- biggest values you have and and being able to play with you know I, I realize this especially with HR where so many of so much of HR is so scared of AI and it's just like just mess around with it like just like you should mess around with like social media and TikTok and you know back in the day when no one was like don't mess around with the internet like just mess around with this stuff so that it's not intimidating so that you can be adaptable later on. None of this stuff is scary if you're willing to play with it and be bad at For stuff sure. because it's okay to be bad. And I think we, we don't know that. Yeah, yeah. First attempt in learning, fail. Someone told me that, Harry. Quite nice. right. uh, last question. So from your experience, what common trait or behavior have you observed in all effective leaders? Oh, wait, say what that again. common trait or behavior have you observed or would you, would you, do you, have you seen in all of the people you would consider to be a very effective leaders? Humility, uh, the ability to not take things so seriously, and um, I don't know what the opposite of narcissist is, <laughs> <laughs> but you know the the uh, the the ability to prioritize your staff over your profit. No. If you do any of those these things as a leader, I've seen the most profitable organizations come from that type of leadership where they care so much about their staff that, um, yeah, they're willing to go above and beyond for them so that their staff can do their most vibrant work. So their whole goal is to be like, how do I make sure my staff truly feel comfortable here and, and feel comfortable enough taking risks and playing uh, and being who they are and then their staff comes through in, in ways that are just simply amazing. Fantastic. Well, listen, Jeff, Harry, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today's show. It's been philosophical. It's been fun. You've made me laugh. You've made me think. So thank you ever so much for joining me, Stay on the HR Lindy Podcast. I will include in the show notes as well a couple of links. One is to Rediscover Your Play, which is Jeff Harry's website, but also another, which is Healing Workplaces Through Play as well. Uh, of course, if you are in the, the market for great HR talent, then I'll also put our own URL, which is jjrecruitment.com. Please do contact myself and my team. And just leaves me to say one more huge thank you, Jeff Harry, for joining me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I look forward to uh, welcoming everyone to the next show very soon, but I wanted to stay here for a moment and give a, a huge thank you. Today's episode of the HR L&D podcast is sponsored by Deal, the all-in-one global people platform that simplifies how you manage the entire global team lifecycle. From contractors, direct employees, EOR, and more, you can manage them all in one place with Deal. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries in minutes, or run payroll in over 100 countries with just one click. Offer competitive benefits, equipment, and equity from a single dashboard. Even customize career roadmaps, performance assessments, and more for your team through Deal's suite of AI-powered learning and development tools. So no matter your global business goals, Deal's team of over 200 legal experts keeps you compliant with local laws every step of the way. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, Deal is built to meet your unique global HR needs. Ready to transform your global HR? Click the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L.